Welcome back. In this series of lessons, we're going to be looking at Python, particularly the programming side. This segment has around nine lessons. The first five will be relevant for both IGCSE and AS level students. The rest of the four lessons will be specifically focused towards A2, especially paper four. Now, if you know the basics of Python, and you know how linear search and binary search and bubble sort and insertion sort work, then you might want to jump into lesson six of the series, which begins with object-oriented programming. But if you are looking at AS level coding, if you are looking at IGCSE level coding, or perhaps you don't understand the basics at all for Python, then you might want to start with this lesson and I'll take you step by step through the entire process. So in this series of lessons, we'll cover the following. The first lesson, this particular one, will focus on print, input, and selection statements. We're then going to move on to loops and arrays. So if you're not sure how loops and arrays work, that lesson is for you. And then finally, with lesson three, we'll focus on functions and procedures and a bit of string manipulation. After that, we're going to be looking at linear and binary search. We're then going to be looking at bubble sort and insertion sort. And then from lesson six onwards, we're going to start looking at the serious stuff, object-oriented programming, classes, things like that. We're going to look at abstract data types, stack, queue, linked list, binary tree, and then we're going to move on to file processing and exception handling before we round everything up with recursion. If you go to this series of nine lessons, you're going to find paper four, one of the most easiest exams that you've ever taken. Provided you practice the programming techniques that we're going to be discussing. If you're watching this series of videos a day or two before the actual exam, chances are you're gonna struggle with this. My suggestion is to maybe have a look at this earlier on in August, September time, and maybe we look at some of these techniques around January before your mock exams, perhaps, and then once again in around March, April time, and you are going to walk into the exam very confident. You won't even need to revise for the exam because this is one of those exams where you will know it all. The average mark in my last couple of years has been around 65 for all the students that have taken paper four, and I hope this series of videos will help you attain the same mark. So let's begin by looking at Python in particular. What is Python? Well, Python is a case sensitive language. What does that mean? That means that you've got to be very careful on how you spell your variable names and commands. There is no need for data type declarations in this, but unfortunately, sometimes the exam board asks for it. So you will need to use comments to declare data types. And we'll look at that in a moment. There is no repeat until loop at all, which is brilliant because there's one less thing to worry about. There is no case of otherwise statements. That's brilliant as well. That means you only need to focus on if, elif, else statements, but you've got to be very careful because indentation is very important in Python and Python is unforgiving if you misindent something in your code. But we're going to be looking at that and establishing good practices as we go along. So let's start by looking at the print function, which is the basic function to output something on screen. So this will output any text or any information that's often stored in a variable. The syntax is simply print, lowercase, brackets, and then if you want to output a string, then you will need to put that in quote marks. Remember to close the bracket as well. You can print any variable, in this case, print number, it will print out whatever the number variable stores, you can print out an array or a value which is stored at a particular index in an array. So you can look at that array, square bracket index, so make sure that you don't muddle up the brackets there. That's one common mistake students make all the time. And finally, you can also have a combination of strings and variables, which is denoted in the last line print. This is the answer, which is basically a string, comma, the answer variable. So you're combining both of them, you're joining things together. We're going to look at that in a moment as well. But before that, let's deal with variables. Python has no command for declaring a variable, and that can be slightly confusing if you come from programming languages where you have to first declare a variable and then assign a value to it. Python is pretty clever, it's more modern. The moment you assign a value to any name, it automatically creates a memory location and it points to that memory location and it knows it's an integer type or a string type or a float type. To me, that's amazing. I don't need to worry about declaring arrays. I don't need to worry about lists. I don't need to worry about declaring variables. I can just simply use them. However, the exam board still deals with some archaic programming languages like Java, like Visual Basic, and you're supposed to declare variables in exam questions. 
Now to deal with that, what they do is they simply say that for Python, you can declare a variable using pseudocode in a comment statement. Now on screen, you can see an example of how we could use a comment statement to declare a variable. It's that simple, just use the hash key and then declare the variable name as a data type. Now variable names need to be defined in a sensible and meaningful way. We can't just randomly choose any letters and make that into a variable because it doesn't mean anything to someone reading the code. So variable name has a set of rules. It must start with a letter or the underscore character. A variable name cannot start with a number. A variable name can only contain alphanumeric characters and underscores. So those are A to Z, 0 to 9, and the underscore character. Variable names are case sensitive. So age, lowercase, sentence case age, and capital age are three different variables according to Python. So be careful on how you spell them. Now let's look at some valid and invalid examples of these. Some is a valid example or lowercase. Sum with a capital S is valid. Underscore sum one is valid according to the rules defined earlier. Invalid examples of variable names would be one sum number cannot begin a variable name. Sum minus one is another example because minus is an operator and that can't be used in a variable name. Sum space one is also invalid because space is an invalid character and is not part of the alphanumeric character set A to Z or 0 to 9 or the underscore character. So be careful on how you spell your variable names. Now each variable generally has a data type. Now Python doesn't really care about data types, but again for exam boards we will need to be very careful in how we specify data types. However, where Python does care about data types is that if you've already defined an existing variable as a particular data type and you can't just go around changing it because that will throw up an error. So the common data types are string str, integer int for numbers, real or as Python calls it float for real numbers, that means decimal numbers, boolean which is true or false, and date. Now you can convert a data type from one to the other or you can find out what the data type of a particular variable is if you don't know that. So here you can see number one is assigned the value 5.456 and the very eagle-eyed will probably automatically know that's a float or real. But if you don't know what that is, you can just simply type the statement print brackets type bracket number one and then close the brackets. Type is a function that is built into Python and returns the data type. Now if you remember your functions and procedures, functions always return something, so therefore this is a function. So number integer in this case, we can also specify that convert that number one into an integer format. So what I'm going to do is take the original number one, which is 5.456, and then I can say int number one, which converts it to five. And then I can print the type of number integer, which would now give me an int, whereas the first one would give me float. Now you can test these commands out by typing them out in your Python ID. I would recommend REPL.IT, which is an online ID. You can use that or you can use PyCharm or whatever ID that your center is going to use for you to do the exam so you get familiar with utilizing that. Remember, online IDs are not allowed in an exam, so your exam center probably is going to be selecting an ID which is local, kind of like PyCharm, or you might use IDLE. So please do have a look at that. Maybe have a discussion with your sensor to find out what ID that they're going to use and then start practicing these commands using that particular ID so you get familiar. And if you don't know what an ID is, it's an integrated development environment which is used by programmers to code. Now be careful with brackets and spelling please because these are the two common mistakes that most students make while programming. It leads to a lot of errors which can easily be fixed. So please make sure that you are constantly checking that your variable names are consistent and your brackets are closed. Now after variables we're going to be looking at mathematical and logical operators. Now these are pretty straightforward and you've encountered them before I hope. Addition is a plus, subtraction is a minus, division is a slash, multiplication is a star. There are two additional ones which are mod and div. Now if you have not done maths properly before you won't know what these are. 
mod basically is the remainder from a division and we use the percentage sign for that. Div is two slashes and that gives the quotient, the number that you divide by. We'll look at that in a moment as well in a bit more detail. Less than and greater than signs are pretty straightforward. Not equal to is the exclamation mark and the equal to sign. It's not the left and the right signs which used to be common in pseudocode. It is the exclamation mark equal to signs together. Less than equal to is pretty straightforward. Greater than or equal to is again pretty straightforward. Remember the greater than and the less than signs come first, then the equal signs come for these ones. And finally, Boolean operators are basically and or not. And we'll look at those operators in a bit more depth. Now less than, greater than, not equal to, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to are logical operators. And these come in handy when we do if statement. Now let's look at div and mod in a bit more depth. If you were dividing 100 by three, you will know that three goes 33 times into 100, which kind of gives you 99. And then you are left with one as a remainder. The basic concept is long division. Now sometimes we just want to get the remainder and we don't want anything else. In that case, we have to use mod, which gives you the one. Div is when you want the quotient, the number that goes into that 100. Three times 33 is equal to 100. So 33 is your quotient or your div. The syntax for div and mod are two slashes for div because one slash is a divide. Two slashes give you the div and percentage symbol is used for mod. Now hopefully that gives you a bit of basic understanding of simple Python syntax. Let's test this out through a practice question. So the first practice question is, you're going to assign 50 to a variable called num1. You're going to multiply that number with 40.49 and store the solution in a variable, which is called answer. You're going to print the integer part of this answer with a relevant message. For example, the answer is declare all the variables that you've used using comment statements. Pause the video and in your IDE, your, your Python development environment, write the code for this. And when you're ready, continue so you can check out the solution or one possible way to solve this. Okay, hopefully you've solved that problem and you've got this type of code. Remember, there could be multiple ways you're doing this, but this is the most common answer to that question. You're declaring num1 as integer, you're declaring answer as real, and then num1 is assigned the value 50, answer is assigned the value of 50 times 40.49, that's why it's real. You're then going to use the print statement and you're going to use a string which says the answer is or whatever sensible message you've written there, comma, integer of answer because we just want the integer part. We don't want the decimal part of that particular answer. And you should have something like the answer is 2024, which is probably the year you will give your exam for this particular syllabus. Let's continue with string concatenation. Now concatenation is a very difficult word to say. So I normally tell my students to divide it into four parts, con, cat, e, nation, and then join them together which is what concatenation is all about, joining things together. Now strings are basically any text in speech marks. And sometimes we want to join two strings or strings and numbers or other things together. And for that, we use concatenation. There are multiple ways to do that. You can do it manually by using something like print brackets, the string Ashley plus the string Patil. You can do that through the use of a variable in this case, combined is equal to Ashley plus Patel, and then I can print the combined out. Now, this combined can be made out of other strings, like you could have a first name string and a surname string, and you can join them together as well. This leads us to practice question two. Assign your first name to a variable, which is called string one, and your second name to a variable, which is called string two. Combine both of the strings with a space between them and store it in a variable called combine underscore string. And then you need to output this variable. Pause the video and program this and then check the answer. Okay, here's one possible solution to the problem. You're going to declare the string one, string two, and combined underscore string as strings in a comment statement. 
String one is going to be your first name. String two is going to be your second name. Combined underscore string is going to be a concatenated version of the two strings plus a space. And then you're going to use the print statement to output the combined underscore string variable. You should have something like your first name, space, your second name printed out on screen. Now, if you made some mistakes and your program doesn't work, check for syntax errors. It's probably because you spelled a variable name incorrectly or you missed a bracket or so. Now, one thing I want to point out is that even though I did not specify in the question for you to declare variables in a common statement, get into a habit of declaring them anyway because you never know they might award one mark for this in an exam question. And chances are it's only going to be one or two marks in the entire exam paper. But if you get into a habit of declaring your variables in common statements for every program that you write, it's going to make your life so much easier. And you might get that hidden mark, which could make the difference between a grade boundary. Now let's look at getting data into a program from a user. In this case, we are going to use an input statement. So in a number variable, we're going to use the input statement and then whatever value that the user types in is going to be assigned to this number variable. Now in Python, the input function always returns a string value. So if it's a number that you're supposed to change it into an integer or float using int number or float number. Alternatively, you could also change the input at the source and as number equals int of whatever the user inputs. Now the brackets and the prompt inside the bracket is used for your user interface to make it easier for the user to know what they're entering. You don't really need to use it, but it makes more sense. Otherwise they just see an empty blinking cursor there and they don't know what they need to type in. Now let's test this out by doing practice question three. Ask two real numbers from the user, add both of these numbers and print the answer with the relevant message. Pause the video and then complete this code and then continue to check the answer or one possible answer. Now on screen you'll probably see a piece of code that solves that. I haven't put the declaration statements here because they would end up taking more of the screen space. However, you should have common statements as well, defining number one and number two, which store a float input from the user. Answer will add number one and number two. That one should also be float and then you simply print with an appropriate prompt the answer. So if you typed in 30.5 and 20.4 as your input numbers, you should get an answer which says 50.9. You can test your program using that if you wish. If your program wasn't working or you've had some difficulty, study this particular code and then continue on to the next part. Now we're going to move on to selection statements. And what are selection statements? Selection statements test conditions and based on a particular condition, they execute a different set of instructions. They use logical conditions most of the time using logical operators like equals, not equals, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. We looked at those logical operators earlier. The only one I want to mention here before we continue is the equals. In Python, we use two equals signs to denote an equal statement because we use one equals as an assignment operator in Python. So for example, number equals 50 is assignment. If number equals 50 will not work, you will need to use if number equals equals 50 because Python specifies two equal signs in a selection statement as saying the left hand side is equal to the right hand side. So be very careful with this. Let's look at the syntax in a bit more detail. If a condition, which could be numbers, two equal signs, 50, then you print something out. Else, we can have another condition. If number equals equals 70, then we print something else out. Else, print something else out. So the if condition statement checks the original condition. The elif condition is used to check multiple conditions. Maybe you want to check four or five different things out. Remember, there is no case of in Python, so we only use if. And the else one simply says that if all the other conditions were checked and they weren't met, then run this part of the code. Now note that Python relies on indentation, which is white space at the beginning of a line to define the scope of the code. So the print statement 
is part of the original condition and it will only run if the original condition was met. Now in other languages, you would probably be using curly brackets or something like that to denote this, but in Python we use indentation. Let's practice a basic if statement using this particular question. So practice question four, ask the user to guess a number and if that number is equal to 20, then print your guess is correct. So it's a simple guessing game. Pause the video, write your code, and then continue to check. Okay, you should have something simple as this. Remember, once again, the comment statements aren't written here. You need to write them down to declare the guess variable. So guess is equal to an integer. In if guess two equal sign is equal to 20, then you print that the guess is correct. So when the user types in 30, nothing will be output. If the user types in 20, you output your guess is correct. That's all the original question wanted you to do. Now, if you decided to use else and elif in there, then you probably jumped the gun because we're going to look at that in practice question five. Else is the keyword that is executed if the first condition is false. And elif is Python's way of saying that if the previous condition was not true, try this one. So now modify that original program from practice question four to output your guess was higher if the guess is higher than 20. And if the guess was lower than 20, then output your guess was lower. You have to use all three parts, if, elif, and else in your code. Pause the video, have a go, and then press continue. Okay, again, haven't defined the common statement to declare guess. Declare guess colon integer would probably be something that starts this code up. Then guess is equal to int input guess the number. In this case, we're going to check if guess is equal to 20. If it is, we're going to print your guess is correct. Elif, guess greater than 20, guess was higher. If it's not correct, if it's not higher, then we simply output your guess was lower. And you can probably have a different set of combinations of these. You might have checked greater than first or less than first, and then output your guess is correct. Whichever method you use, you should have this type of structure. Okay, let's look at Boolean operators and how these can be used with selection statements. And basically means both the conditions should be true, or means any one condition should be true, not means the opposite of what is true. So an example could be that if guess is less than 20 or guess is greater than 20, then you output your guess is incorrect, else your guess is correct. So we're using a Boolean operator to say that if this condition is met or this condition is met, then you output this, else you output the correct. Because if it's not less than 20 or greater than 20, then it's the correct answer. Now with practice question six, you're going to practice this and you're going to use Boolean operators to solve it with a selection statement. So ask the user for three real numbers and then print the largest number out. So the user is going to type in three numbers so you could probably take three variables and then you can compare them to work out which is the largest. Pause the video, have a go, and then press play when you're ready to check one possible solution. Okay, so you should have something similar to this. Once again, there are no declaration statements because you can see the code is becoming a bit big now. So A, we're going to get a float input from the user. B is the second float input. You could call it number one, number two, number three, which would probably be more sensible. And then we simply compare it if a greater than b and a greater than c, then quite clearly a is the largest number. We output that. Well, if we check if b is greater than a and b is greater than c, then quite clearly b is the largest number. Else, that means the only option left, c is the largest number. Do we need to have another elif statement saying c greater than a and c greater than b? Not really, because if the first two statements aren't true, then quite clearly the final one is going to be the correct output. So sometimes when you could write it down, it's up to you. But what are you going to write in the else part? Okay, we could also do this using a nested if statement. Now a nested if statement is basically an if within an if. So when you're not using Boolean operators, you can use two if statements to get the same answer. So here we're going to check if a is greater than b first, and then in that we're going to check if a is also greater than c, and then we're going to print out a is the largest. 
Then we're going to do another nested if statement where we're going to say if b was greater than a, then inside that if b is greater than c, and then if that's true, then we print b is the largest. Else we simply say c is the largest. Now nested if statements are lengthier, they're more inefficient, and if you can use Boolean operators, chances are you can make your code quite concise and efficient, but they can be very confusing to read. If you have multiple Boolean operators, they can become quite complex to solve. So the choice is up to you. Clarity in your code versus conciseness and complexity. Now we're going to put everything together in practice question seven. You're going to ask the user to enter an email address and a password. And if these are correct, then you're going to print login successful. And if one of them is wrong, then you're going to print incorrect login information. Now the correct email is if at gmail.com and the correct password is else 99. Pause the video and then have a go. And when you're ready, continue to check one possible solution. Okay, on screen you can see the solution. We can declare these variables email as a string, password as a string, and then we take the input and store it in email. We take the input from the user and store it in password. And then we use if email is equal to the correct one and password is the correct one, then login successful, else incorrect. Again, quite effective with Boolean operators. You could use a nested if here as well, if email is equal to if at gmail.com. And then a nested if statement saying, if password is equal to else 99, then print login successful else print incorrect login information. That's also possible. With that, we draw this lesson to a close. Hopefully, you now understand basic Python syntax. You've had some practice in coding. You should be able to declare variables in Python using comments. You should understand the use of div and mod. That is quite useful. They normally ask for div and mod in one question. I've seen that in past papers. So be careful with utilizing that and understanding how it works. Use of the print and input commands, that's pretty straightforward. Understand the use of concatenation and joining things together. Use the if, elif, else selection statements and understand the use of nested if statements and how Boolean and logical operators work in relation to statements as well. Now these Boolean and logical operators are quite useful because they also come in handy when we do loops. So we're going to be looking at that in one of the future lessons as well. That's all for today. If you do have any questions, please do post them in the comments and I'll see you in the next one.